Good afternoon, and welcome to another episode of Likeable Science here on Think Tech Hawaii. We have with us today a very special guest, uh, Dr. Virginia Hinshaw. Welcome, Virginia. Uh, hello. Good to have her. She, she is a Chancellor Emeritus from uh, Jabson, the uh, John, a, John A. Byrne School of Medicine, uh, and has uh, been a researcher for many years on flu and vaccines. And so right. that's what we're going to talk about here towards the end of this year's flu season. Mm -hmm. But it's being a pretty heavy flu season in a lot of parts of the country. I don't think too bad here, right? Right, not yet. No. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe we should just start by, by sort of explaining what, what is flu, you know? Okay, influenza right. is, is a virus, right. okay. and it causes flu uh, by infecting people, and it spreads really quickly, and it's a global disease. It's not just a local disease. The whole world shares it. Viruses don't need visas. They just come <laughs> on in. <laughs> so it's, and it's um, in humans, lower mammals, and birds. So it has a wide distribution in nature. Okay. And, so that's, and it also changes a lot. So mm -hmm. that's one of the challenges with it. Right, and it can be relatively mild in some cases mm -hmm. for some people, just almost like a, a little cold, although mm -hmm. typically we'll have some fever or something associated with it, more aches. But it can also be very, very dangerous, certain strains at least, right? The, oh, the, most like definitely. The 1918 Spanish yep. flu epidemic. Yep. The 1918 uh, killed 20 to 40 million people. Wow. And actually more people died of influenza than more related injuries. Wow. And so that one was a particularly interesting strain. And they've actually reconstituted it right. by digging up uh, bodies that in the tundra in Alaska and, re and looking at the genetic material that was still there mm -hmm. from the virus and then remaking it. And it was still what we call hot or highly virulent. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, hopefully they kept Not all of them are like that. Those, those <laughs> right. are the nasty cousins you don't ever ask for dinner. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Um, but that's, and there have been a few since then. There was an Asian flu epidemic. Um, mm -hmm years after mm -hmm. that and uh, we've had several pandemic right. yeah. when the whole world experience it's called a pandemic yeah, right. a world flu uh, local epidemics right. or something like in Hawaii or something but right. we've had many uh, pandemics right. and those are because the virus has changed significantly right and you, you hit on a very interesting point early on when you commented that, that uh, influenza virus lives in mammals mm -hmm. birds and well, we are a mammal of course yeah. Uh, but it crosses species lines fairly easily sometimes, right? Yeah, it's rather striking at times, and probably one of the examples that people have heard the most about lately is the H5N1 in chickens right. and poultry. The bird flu. Yeah, bird flu. And that one is very hot in the fact it kills 100% of the birds in three or four days. And unfortunately, it has transmitted to people. And that required very close contact, uh, particularly if they're killing the birds or processing them in bird markets mm -hmm. and things. Thankfully, it never acquired the ability to go person to person. And that is a characteristic we look for for pandemic strains. Right. Because those are the ones that'll take off. Right. Things, then they test this in like a ferret model and watch yeah. how, how easily the ferrets transmit it from one to another. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and that gives them a clue as to how contagious that's going to be. Correct. Right. Yeah. And so we, there's these two sort of separate issues, right? There's the, the how contagious it is and how sort of strong or lethal it is. Or. Right, and, and the one H5N1, the one from the birds, has a 50% death rate in people. Ooh. So it's so, very yeah. traumatic. Yeah, so we cer certainly don't want that. And, and so how does, how does flu virus manage this? I mean, we have very sophisticated scientists working on it, like yourself and many others. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we've beaten back a lot of viral diseases, uh, at least mm -hmm. kept them down, if not totally eliminated them. Uh, but flu seems endlessly resurgent. Yes, it is. There are two major reasons, and I can, can illustrate that for you. One is the ability to change. Mm -hmm. It mutates regularly. And also the large animal reservoir that occurs in nature that's probably been there for millenniums. Oh, many different species. Mm -hmm. okay. mm -hmm. Particularly birds, right. and particularly migratory birds like ducks. Oh, well, and it doesn't necessarily bother them. Right, <laughs> but it lets them spread it. It goes around, yeah. yeah. Okay. Excellent, excellent. But so... Uh, you, you hinted at the fact that it changes, it mutates, it evolves mm -hmm. very rapidly. Mm -hmm. um, I was reading a little bit about because the, the, the uh, vaccine for this year's flu was really a, a little more attuned to a, mm -hmm. a different strain of what has actually ended up sort of at the, at later in the season, it's actually mm -hmm. going around now, right? And, and, and yeah, what happens is it goes through people, and we're usually on the tail end of the epidemics in the U.S., uh, it, it mutates, and sometimes it mutates where it's less of a problem, sometimes more of a problem. Mm -hmm. But the vaccine is still a very good idea. Right, absolutely. Even, even with only moderate effectiveness, vaccine is right. always a good idea. But, mm -hmm. 
um, despite all the anti-vaxxer campaigns around. Right. <laughs> just, those people are <coughs> doing no one any favor. Um, so can you, can you illustrate the, uh, this business of the mutation? Oh, yeah, I'd love to do that. Well, first of all, you have to use your imagination, okay. and I know you've got that, and our viewers do too. You have to imagine that my head is a virus. Okay. In this case, I'm an influenza virus. Okay. Uh, and I have a hemagglutinin, an H, you know, the number H3, right. um, and that's my ear. Okay. And my hair is the neuraminidase, the N. Okay. Okay, the hemagglutinin is what attaches to a cell, okay. and the neuraminidase, the N, is what helps the virus get out of the cell to go to other cells. Right, so it's got to do both tasks, right? right? But a uh, virus is whole goal in life is to get into a cell because it can't reproduce itself. Right. It has to have the cell's machinery. Right. So what I do is I come along and I attach uh -huh. and I enter and then I make thousands of virus particles which then go on and infect you and everybody else. Mm -hmm. So now so, so a lot of people sense. don't love viruses like I do. Right. They want to prevent them and right. so do I. Right. So you go take vaccines. Mm -hmm. And when you get a vaccine, I can reach down here and get this. What your body produces is antibodies. And this is structurally correct, slightly enlarged. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so what happens is now when I come along, mm -hmm. if I had this antibody mm -hmm. in my body and I come along, I can't attach. Right, the virus can't. And get... that means the vaccine worked. Right. And that's where we got rid of smallpox with a great vaccine, but the virus okay. doesn't change. Um, and so that's how a conceptually a virus a vaccine works, is you induce antibodies that okay. protect you. And now flu does something that uh, makes it very difficult in that it changes. I'm coming back. <laughs> All right. It mutates. Right. Now we go. Now, <laughs> you, you, you change your I'm still recognizable right. as Virginia right. Henshaw, like the, right. I was originally, but I'm slightly different or right. altered. Right, you have a okay. different external coat there, as it Yes, were. so what I've mutated. Right. And so what happens now is the antibodies don't fit so well. Oh. And so I can now still infect and spread Good. to other people. Okay. Okay. And this is actually what happens with HIV, but it does it over and over again in the same person. Right. And okay. that's one of the reasons it's so difficult okay. to control. The flu now does something no other virus does. It Whoa. changes dramatically. Wow. Okay, right. So <laughs> now I'm not recognizable right. exactly. <laughs> as Virginia Henshaw. Right. And what happened is I acquired a new hat, uh -huh. a new H or a new N uh -huh. or both. Right. And the way this happens is because the virus, there are viruses and other species that have genes, influenza viruses, that those genes can get interchanged with the one that was in the human virus. Right. And so this one, this is called antigenic shift, and this is drift. Okay. This happens each year, and that's the reason we have to often change the vaccine every right. year. This is what causes pandemics or worldwide epidemics because nobody has any protection. Okay. And the mechanism that it uses is called genetic reassortment. I've got two viruses here. Okay. This one's a human influenza virus. This is an avian, a okay. bird influenza virus. If they get into the same host and the same cell, which doesn't happen real often, and they have eight genes, eight RNA segments okay. are the, is the genome for these viruses. And they get in the same one. What happens, I can create 256 different influenza viruses from yeah, this. Yeah, new, new different strains, different right. coats. And that's different, where those yeah. new hats come from. Right. And then they go out and spread and cause worldwide problems. Right. Because you don't have any antibodies against these. Right, right. Like this hat. Right. That's an H5. Right. That, 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 that okay. is an example of that. Um, but we have 18 different H's and 11 different N's out there. Right. So, so there's a wealth of them, and almost all of them exist in avian species. Uh, yeah. I mean, we generally only deal with a few, a very limited number with, with yeah, us, right? They're usually yeah. only about two in people at right. any one time. Uh, there's an influenza B, but it's a totally separate virus. Um, but there are usually two, at least two influenza A viruses circulating. Right, and but then the, the sort of the big fear is that yeah, yeah. We, get, we get one of these new this uh, is the uh, fear. radical one around. Yeah, and it happens to be a hot right. or a highly virulent strain right. 
That's what they worry about based on the 1918 right. epidemic or pandemic. And th if that happened, then people would not have any protection and we could lose a lot of people's lives. Right, right. Um, and indeed, that 1918 epidemic was interesting in that, that most of the time, the people who are most at risk from the flu are the elderly and mm -hmm. the very young, right? Yeah. But that one actually had a very funny, almost reverse distribution, although it did take up the elderly and young. It took a big chunk of sort of normal, healthy people. Yeah, it did, and it did and, it rapidly. Yeah. Even though we didn't have antibiotics at that point, right. but this was much faster than normal. Within three days, people were dying. And you're right, it hit a lot of young people. And there is a reason for that. Some of the avian, or some of the viruses, not in birds and people, induce what we call a cytokine storm. And cytokines are normal products that we produce in our bodies. Right. And we need them for lots of different things. But if you overproduce, then it can cause damage, particularly right. to the lungs. And these are young people, right. so they have more robust immune responses right. than those of us who might be older. Right. And so they, they are susceptible. In to that them. case, right, the, the better immune system actually worked against them because yes, it, it the basically got mm -hmm. triggered mm -hmm. too strongly in some sense. Yeah. And the people basically, or their, their own immune systems essentially killed them. Killed right. Them. right. Yeah. yeah, the virus, but you put that virus that can induce that together and it can really harm young people. Now, most of the older people are susceptible because they have other issues. Right. And it taxes the heart, the lungs, all, all the body functions. Right. Uh, but they also developed a vaccine specifically for older people. Oh, okay. It's called Fluzone, okay. and it has four times the amount of virus in it. Huh. Because our immune responses have slowed or waned somewhat, and so they give us more to boost it a little bit better, and they give it every year, hopefully, you huh. should, uh, so that in case we don't respond one year, we'll get it the next year and we'll be better and better. Excellent, excellent. Mm -hmm. Well, it's good, good to see that people are working on these, these sorts of uh, issues and, and clearly the medical profession understands actually a great deal about what, what, what goes on and what, what their challenges are, right? Well, influenza is a, um, is a killer. Yeah. I mean, it, it kills between uh, twenty and 40,000 people in the U.S. each year, right. even the milder strains. And if you had one that was like a highly hot strain in people, uh, the toll would be much higher. Yeah. So we do want to prevent it. Right, absolutely, absolutely. And we're going to talk a little more about how the prevention end of things go um, after we come back from a little break here. Uh, I've got Virginia Hinshaw here, the uh, chancellor from the John A. Burns School of Medicine at UH Manala, talking about flu and vaccines, and we'll be uh, back in about one minute. Hi, I'm Rusty Komori, host of Beyond the Lines on Think Tech Hawaii. My show is based on my book, also titled Beyond the Lines, and it's about creating a superior culture of excellence, leadership, and finding greatness. I interview guests who are successful in business, sports, and life, which is sure to inspire you in finding your greatness. Join me every Monday as we go Beyond the Lines at 11 a.m. Aloha. <sighs> Aloha and mabuhai. My name is Emmy Ortega Anderson, inviting you to join us every Tuesday here on Pinoy Power Hawaii with Think Tech Hawaii. We come to your home at 12 noon every Tuesday. We invite you to uh, listen, watch uh, for our mission of empowerment. We aim to enrich, enlighten, educate, entertain, and we hope to empower. Again, maraming salamat po. Mabuhay and aloha. And you're back here <coughs> on Likeable Science. I'm your host, Ethan Allen, here on Think Tech Hawaii. With me today in the Think Tech Studios is Dr. Virginia Hinshaw, the Chancellor Emeritus from, the, from Jabson. And thank you for being here again. Uh, we've been talking about flu and vaccines and, and how uh, she was giving us a, a vivid demonstration of, of just how the sort of mechanics of the whole thing of, of vaccines work uh, against flu. Uh, I want to dig in a little more about this business of vaccines, though. It, you know, it often seems that we're, we're making vaccines for one strain of flu and then the, the flu is, that's around is actually a slightly different strain or it's all, already evolving away. What's the reason for that sort of lag that exists? Why, why is it that we can't make, you know, just start cranking out a lot of vaccine really quickly? Well, it's how it's made okay. is part of the problem. And, and for meeting safety standards, it takes a long time to get them through that process. 
takes about six months. Ooh. And each year, uh, WHO and CDC and all the labs that cooperate with them well, Health Organization compare, Center for yeah. Disease Control. Yep. Okay. They, they compare their viruses. Okay. And they see which, they have, to, they have to determine which one has the most likely risk of being the one for the next fall. Okay. So it's an educated, it's a very educated guess, but it has to be a guess. Mm -hmm. and, and then everybody in the world uses the same vaccine. Okay. And so when you make it, you grow it in embryonated chicken eggs typically. Oh, okay. And so that is it, and then you purify it and yeah. inactivate it. The flu virus is inactive, it's dead. The oh. virus is dead. And then you distribute it. And so that's about a six month process. Now, some companies now are making it in what we call tissue culture, which is particularly for people who are allergic to eggs. Because okay. even if you, you know, when a virus comes out of a cell, it takes a little bit of the cell with it, so it's, okay. there's egg. Right. And so people that are allergic to eggs are not to take the normal one, they take the, that special one. Um, and there's a lot of research going on on what we call getting a universal flu vaccine. Because to get around all these, to make an antibody that would work against any flu virus, you have to find something on the virus that never changes. Right, and that's important to its function. Yes. Right. And that has been very difficult with right. flu. Yeah. And also with the animal reservoir, you've always got the possibility of new hats coming in <laughs> that the antibody that you might, you wouldn't have this antibody that would work. Right. So again, you've got this, this sort of processing bottleneck because you've got, to, you've got to incubate this and grow it in eggs, which mm -hmm. must be, I mean, a sort of tedious technical pro process involving lots and lots of eggs, one presumes. Well, and one really interesting aspect that people need to consider is if you get a hot influenza virus in birds, in your country or wherever the vaccine's being made, you don't have any eggs oh. because it kills the birds. Oh. And actually the, the viruses, the hot viruses don't grow as well. Okay. And so you have to grow more to get what you need for the people because it has to have a certain level of the virus in it mm -hmm. to be effective. But certainly now uh, researchers must be working on, on some better, newer methods to try to get around this the, the bottleneck, right? I mean, oh. with uh, the new genetic engineering techniques, you would think they could start slicing and dicing uh, viruses and, and get bacteria, for instance, start cranking, cranking vaccines out? Well, they've tried a lot of different okay. things, but flu is so good at changing. It's a, mm -hmm. it's a virus that can mutate fairly readily and still right. function. And that is a huge challenge. And also, animal reservoir, we will never eradicate flu. Right. Uh, we hope to control the disease better. Right. But because we have the animal reservoir and the virus is so good at, at changing. Right. And you know, a lot of viruses, I gather, are found in one or two or a very small number of species, but mm -hmm. the flu virus, you say, lives in lots and lots of different species, so it's kind well, of... Well, and it crosses species, right. yeah. like, it, like the bird flu went into people, and I had an interesting um, situation a number of years ago, we had an outbreak in seals, Wow. and it was an avian influenza virus that infected seals in New England, and there were a lot of deaths, and then we were doing some experiments in um, Greenland with seals, and this young man an infected seal spit in his eye, huh. and he developed conjunctivitis, and it was the flu virus from the seal that had caused the conjunctivitis. So here you had an avian virus that had gotten into seals or mammals and then into people. And we went back and talked to the people that worked on the infected the seals in the wild, and they also had a problem with conjunctivitis. So. Huh. Flu is an interesting virus in that it can change species. Mm -hmm. uh, we've had many, many examples of that. Pigs to people and people to pigs. Right, right. It's not just one way there. Right, exactly. We're, <laughs> we're, we're in a sense feeding the loop. We are part of the, part of the reservoir, right? Right. Yeah. And, and, you know, that we have it in horses. We have it in all kinds of different species, dogs, cat. They can pick up flu. So it is one of those uh, viruses that is able to move around. And so that's why we do a lot of surveillance to see where is it and what's it doing. Mm -hmm. The hallmark that we're looking for is did it go from person to person? Right. If it stops with this one host, uh, then we realize it probably doesn't have the potential to cause a pandemic. Right, even if it's a nasty virus right. and hurts or right. kills a lot of people, it's still, yeah. they can't spread that rapidly, so it's ultimately not that big a threat that way. Right. But if it acquires that ability to transmit mm -hmm. between people, then then we're, we have the potential, as you say, for, for a pandemic. Yeah, and we've had uh, many examples of where we thought maybe it'd take off, like the swine flu. Right. Um, and we vaccinated millions of people. It didn't take off, thankfully. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, there's always that risk with influenza because of all 
the different host. Right. And the biggest reservoir probably is migratory ducks, mm -hmm. but it doesn't typically bother them. Right. And in mammals, it's respiratory disease. Right. And in, in ducks, it's intestinal. Oh, it replicates okay. in the intestinal tract and then is excreted in the feces. Oh. If anybody, it, there is no such thing as stomach flu, literally. Right. Um, flu does not replicate there. Right. Uh, so people are calling you a bird if they. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but that's, uh, that's, a, that's an interesting point about, about it's um, spreading through, through the birds to, to the people so we can get it through any reasonably light contact, that is, if birds are pooping everywhere, of course, and that's when that blows in the dust, and we inhale that and start that whole cycle again. It depends on the virus. Right. You know, some of them are more infectious, like the H5N1, mm -hmm. obviously, was more infectious mm -hmm. than most viruses. And that one actually killed a lot of different species. It actually killed some tigers in a zoo because they fed them some infected birds. Oh, wow. Oh. Uh, but now, I love the ducks and the wildlife, mm -hmm. and so... Uh, I've interacted with it for many years. These are rare occasions. These are not common mm -hmm. events. And that's the reason you only periodically have pandemics. Mm -hmm. You have epidemics all the time because it's continuing to grow and spread in people. Right. right. But on occasion, if it swaps genes, right. you can get the emergence of a new strain. Right. And this is why, again, though, the, the, the issue of vaccination is so important, right? We've, we've seen with another viral disease, chickenpox, now, what mm -hmm. happens when you stop vaccinating a population. Yeah, measles. Mm, Check here. <laughs> yeah, when the, when the vaccination rate drops below a critical point, something like 92, 95 percent mm -hmm. of the population, right. suddenly there are enough unvaccinated individuals around that the virus can get a foothold. Yeah. yeah, well, what we're looking for in most cases with viruses that we can't eradicate, mm -hmm. and flu is one of those, is we're looking for herd immunity. Right. So that enough people are vaccinated so the virus doesn't have many susceptible hosts and kind of gets stalled out. Right. So... Yeah, you stop the epidemic or the pandemic mm -hmm. before it can really Take up. get going, mm -hmm. right? And this is, I mean, that's a good argument why you should pay attention to the public health authorities when they say, hey, we're, having, we're entering a flu season, go get your flu shot, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm an advocate, and certainly I believe that it reduces the uh, morbidity and mortality to do that. Plus, you don't serve as a source Right. For other people, and uh, you know, in universities, we have lots of young people, and we, they're going all different directions during the holidays, and they all come back together, which is a big risk factor for transmission and bringing new ones in. So, yeah, and, and a lot of students do it because they don't want to miss two weeks for their studies or their athletics or whatever it is. Right. It's a good idea. Yeah, and, and you know, people say, oh, I don't want to get my children vac vaccinated. Uh, you know, against the measles because I think mm -hmm. it's a bad idea or I think it's dangerous or whatever, but they're not just impacting their own children, they're impacting the other kids yes. and the adults actually around too, right? Yeah, the uh, best response I ever heard to that was a fellow that was talking to an anti-vaxxer, as they call him, and she said, I don't want to hurt my child, I love my child. And he says, well, I love my children too, but the difference is I love your child as well. Because you have to have a concern for the other people in the population. Right. And that's what you're trying to do is protect not only your own child or yourself, but protect everybody else. Right. And that's why you need those high rates of vaccination mm -hmm. among a population for the vaccine really to truly achieve its aims, right? Well, particularly for measles. Measles right. is the most contagious viral disease okay. we have. Okay. It infects a lot of people really quickly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And so you really need a very high level of herd immunity, so oh. to speak, okay. um, to protect the population. Right. right. Well, we are, we are having great success in some, some viruses. We, we're getting down to the very last of the polio, right? Oh, that's very exciting. Yeah. yeah. We may, yeah. may get it off the face of the earth in the next few well, years. Polio and measles should be eradicated. Huh. They have every potential. They don't change. They're only in, in mammals and people. Huh. Um, they have a really good vaccine. Mm -hmm. uh, everything is right for those two. In the case of polio, it's been primarily because of war and strife in areas. Right. Afghanistan and Pakistan they still have the last pockets, right? Yeah, they're the last pockets, right. and, and suspicion right. uh, is a problem. Uh, with measles, it's really having so many people that aren't vaccinated, and there is a good vaccine for it, and right. it does work, and there is no connection with autism. Right. Right. That's been shown time and time again. Right. Um, and it's a shame when we see that coming back because it has increased dramatically. Right. There, there's sort of no excuse for it. I mean, it, it, it's a result of very sort of anti-science thinking. Well, um, the other day somebody, a child had tetanus, 
which is a deadly disease, right. and there should never be a tetanus case now. Right. Because the vaccine's great, and you really should have that. And keep it up to date. People forget that every 10 years, right. you're supposed to get a little boost. Right. And that's really important, particularly in where we live, where we're walking barefoot or whatever, right. step on something. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's really important to stay sort of tuned into to what is happening in the vaccine world, pay attention to what, what your doctor rec recommends about mm -hmm. getting a given vaccine, getting your boosters regularly, mm -hmm. uh, staying thoroughly um, protected here because it's, it's an ongoing struggle, right? I mean... Oh, yeah. It, it, and flu is uh, the champion of change. <laughs> that has been a challenge with it. And uh, the fascinating virus is a very old virus. Hippocrates described influenza symptoms mm -hmm. 400 B.C. Wow. So it's been around a long time, right. and um, we, but we can make progress on reducing the disease right. for people and for animals. We work a lot on animals, too, because if people lose their animal source because that's their protein or their income, mm -hmm. then they have a major problem as well. So it's, it's both all populations. Sure, and again, you're, you're working on the reservoir, trying mm -hmm. to as low reservoir as possible, basically. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, keep them healthy, too. Yeah, exactly. And I said, and with influenza, it's not just keeping your next door neighbor healthy, it's keeping your global neighbor healthy. Right. Yeah, more, more and more, I think, actually, that's a, a beautiful example of how we need more and more to be thinking globally and realizing oh, okay. that, that, that what we do impacts not just us, not just the people around us, but literally can blow around the globe if mm -hmm. these viruses can. Yeah, and particularly where we are, we have people coming from yep. all different directions exactly. here yeah. in Hawaii, which is lovely. Right. But um, we do have to stay attuned to the fact that uh, microbes rule right. in a lot of ways. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Virginia. It's been a real pleasure having you here. Well, I've learned a lot, uh, as I do each time you're on my show. So I, I thank you very much for sharing your, your knowledge and wisdom with us here. Mm, my pleasure. And I hope you'll come back and uh, visit us next week for another episode of Likeable Science here on Think Tech Hawaii.